Good morning. Today is the 13th Sunday after Trinity, and this is a service of anti-communion. The service begins on page 67 with the Collect for Purity. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe we beseech thee to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that, through thy most mighty protection both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, of whose only gift it cometh that thy faithful people do unto thee true and laudable service, grant, we beseech thee, that we may so faithfully serve thee in this life, that we fail not finally to attain thy heavenly promises, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The epistle is written in the third chapter of St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, beginning at the 16th verse. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God, before of God in Christ, The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Here endeth the epistle. The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel of St. Luke, the tenth chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, beginning at the twenty-third verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, 
And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him upon his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took two, out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us. Under Pontius Pilate he suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, today is the 13th Sunday after Trinity, and if you recall, last week's reading for the epistle from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in that reading, St. Paul gave a contrast between the letter and the spirit, between the ministry of condemnation and the ministry of righteousness. He spoke about the glory of the giving of the law, but St. Paul noted that despite the law's glory, it brought condemnation on the people. By contrast, the gospel brings righteousness and far surpasses the law in its glory. That's a bit of a review of last week's epistle. And then in the homily for last week, again, a little bit of review, we, we talked about the distinction we see in much of the scriptures between the law and the gospel, a distinction that is based on the respective purposes of law and gospel. That is, the law was never meant to save us. It was never meant to make us righteous. Rather, the law was meant to define good and evil, to expose our sin, to send us to God for mercy, and then to show us how God expects his redeemed people to live. By contrast, the gospel tells us what God has done for us. It shows us God's promises, and by uniting us to Christ, the gospel makes us righteous. Now, in today's epistle, St. Paul again gives us a lesson on the distinction between the law and the gospel. So let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Galatians 3, 16, and this is on page 207 in the prayer book. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seed, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. 
For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So here in this passage, we see that the promises of God, the gospel, as it were, actually predates the law of Moses. Now, this can be an odd line of thought. After all, isn't the gospel based on the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ? And he obviously lived many generations after Moses. Now, it is indeed true that the promises of the gospel are revealed and fulfilled in Jesus. But nevertheless, we have hints of the gospel and of God's promises that speak to those later to be revealed truths throughout the Old Testament. And indeed, as early as the, what we call the Proto-Evangelium, that is the Proto-Gospel in Genesis chapter 3, when God promises that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's heel, we see hints of the Messiah's mission. <coughs> Excuse me. As St. Augustine says, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. In our epistle then, today, St. Paul is saying that God's covenant with and promises to Abraham are another one of these Old Testament hints at the gospel, these Old Testament presentations of the gospel. St. Paul says that the promises God made to Abraham find their fulfillment and were always pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the covenant with Abraham, God sets apart a people to become his own family. He promises them an inheritance of land and, and, and other, other aspects. He promises to bring blessings on the whole world through Abraham's seed. Now, it is true that a partial fulfillment of this promise comes in the creation of the nation of Israel. St. Paul says, nevertheless, that there was something bigger in mind, something that was about a single descendant, the Messiah. St. Paul makes this argument based on the contrast between the word seed and the word seeds. Remember we read in our epistle, He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Now, St. Jerome, who is the first major Hebrew scholar of the Church Fathers, and he's the greatest scripture scholar of his day, and in fact, he's the one who translated the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate, that Latin translation that becomes the default Bible of the West for hundreds of years after his time. St. Jerome points out that the Hebrew in the Old Testament does not include the word seeds anywhere. And the great reformer John Calvin notes that the Hebrew word for seed is in fact a collective noun. That is, seed can be used either plural or singular, but it typically refers to a group. Think, think uh, um, for, uh, for an example in English, think of our English words bunch or family. You don't have a bunch that consists of just a single grape, right? You don't have a family consisting of just a single person. It doesn't work that way. So apparently what John Calvin was saying is that there was a common anti-Christian apologetic in his day whereby some of the Jewish polemicists were accusing St. Paul of misinterpreting the text. They were saying that St. Paul apparently didn't know his Old Testament very well, despite the fact that Paul was a student of the great Gamaliel, who was, who was universally recognized by Judaism to, be the, Judaism to be the greatest Jewish scholar of the first century. Calvin notes, however, that no one would have said that the covenant with Abraham passed on to all of his children. Ishmael was not 
the one to whom the promise applied. Nor were the children of Keturah, the woman that Abraham married after Sarah's death. No, the covenant only applied to Isaac. Isaac is the seed immediately to whom the covenant applies. And in the same way, the promises do not pass on to both of Isaac's children. The Old Testament is very clear that the covenant applies to Jacob, not to Esau. So St. Paul here is saying that the fulfillment of the covenant, that ultimate fulfillment, is through Jesus, through the promised Messiah, not through the entire people of Israel. Nevertheless, this does not mean that God abandoned his promises to Israel, nor does it mean that the old covenant promises are disannulled, as our text says. In fact, St. Paul tells us that the law and the promises are not against each other. They are not contradictory. Rather, each one has its own purpose. The law was not meant to give life, nor was it meant to make us righteous. It should be no surprise then that the law is unable to do so. Rather, as we said before, the law was meant to expose sin by showing us God's righteous standards. It was meant to accuse us of our sin so that we would see our need for God's mercy. It was there to drive us to God so that he could give us the gospel. Later on in, in the book of Galatians, St. Paul will call it a schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. And it is this gospel then that gives life and indeed makes us righteous. Now with that in mind, it may seem like our gospel reading for this Sunday, our gospel passage, gives us a little bit of a problem, especially, especially in the opening scene. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 23, and you can find this on page 208 in your prayer book. Jesus said, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now one of the most important rules of scripture interpretation is that we do not pit scripture against scripture. We do not play scripture against itself. As Article 20 of our 39 Articles of Religion says, it is not lawful for the church to ordain anything that is contrary to God's word written, neither may it so expound one place of scripture that it be repugnant to another. Yet, in our gospel passage, Jesus seems to be telling the certain lawyer, and a lawyer in this context is a scripture scholar, a Bible teacher, Jesus is telling this lawyer that if he keeps the law, he will inherit eternal life. This is exact opposite of what St. Paul just taught us in Galatians 3. Well, there are two principles of scripture interpretation which help us here. First, always interpret the more difficult passage of scripture in light of those that are more clear. So St. Paul's teaching on the law and gospel is in fact very straightforward and it leaves us no room for doubt. It's very didactic, it's very clear. The second principle is that the wider context of a passage will often shed light on a more difficult part of the passage. So the opening sentence in our gospel helps shed some of that light. We read, blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So like St. Paul, our Lord is saying that the events of his incarnation, his, uh, his three years of ministry, on to his death, resurrection, and ascension are the fulfillment of the Old Testament expectations, promises, and indeed the whole Old Testament story. The law is pointing beyond itself to the Messiah. 
Now, furthermore, if we continue on in the gospel passage, we get even more clarity. Verse 29 says this, but he, that is the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So the scripture scholar, the Bible teacher, the lawyer, he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to prove himself to be righteous. He wanted to excuse any transgression of the summary of the law by finding a loophole based on defining the term neighbor. He wanted to get off on a technicality. This is the very essence of legalism. Jesus' answer to his self-justification is the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus said, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So in telling this parable, Jesus gave the lawyer the full force of the law, and he exposed the lawyer's failure to love God and to love his neighbor. He showed the lawyer his own sin. He showed him that he too, scripture scholar and Bible teacher though he was, needed mercy. This is, of course, the very thing that St. Paul was teaching the Galatians in our epistle. And it is important to note that Jesus told the lawyer that he ought to live up to that greater standard of love. As someone that was part of God's people Israel, the law indeed did show the lawyer how he ought to live. But make no mistake, the good Samaritan in the parable is ultimately not this lawyer, nor is it you and me. Though we do have a call to show that same kind of mercy, in this parable, we are the man who was beaten half to death by the thieves. We are those who have been oppressed by the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is our Lord Jesus Christ who is the Good Samaritan. He is the one who binds up our wounds with the oil of the Holy Spirit and the wine of the Blessed Sacrament. He's the one who shows mercy. And as we say in the general confession from morning and evening prayer, there is no health in us, but thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. The lawyer had trusted the law to save him. He thought that the priest and the Levite could help him, but they could not. By their very holiness, the priest and the Levite had to pass on the other side, lest they become ceremonially unclean and be unable to fulfill their duties in the temple. The very holiness of the law cannot rescue us. It can only accuse us of our sin and expose us, expose our sin to us. But the Samaritan, the despised natural enemy of the accosted pilgrim, Samaritans and Jews hated each other in those days. The Samaritan, that natural enemy despised by the pilgrim is the one who rescued him, who saved him. The prophet Isaiah describes the Messiah as one who is despised and rejected of men. And indeed, our Lord Jesus was put to death by his own people. Nevertheless, the prophet continues in Isaiah 53, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God by reason of our sin and self-justification, Jesus died to reconcile us to God. 
He justified us in order to unite us in righteousness and holiness to the Blessed Trinity. He gave us his goodness. He healed us of our affliction, rescued us from the robbers, and brought us to the inn of the church. He has indeed showed us mercy. And it's only after we have received that mercy that we can say, go and do likewise. And we say this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Service continues with the bidding prayer on page 47 in the prayer book. Let us pray. Good Christian people, I bid your prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church, the blessed company of all faithful people, that it may please God to confirm and strengthen it in purity of faith, in holiness of life, and in perfectness of love, and to restore to it the witness of visible unity, and more especially for that branch of the same planted by God in this land, whereof we are members, that in all things it may work according to God's will, serve him faithfully, and worship him acceptably. You shall pray for the President of these United States, and for the Governor of this state, and for all that are in authority, that all and every one of them may serve truly in their several callings to the glory of God and the edifying and well-governing of the people, remembering the account they shall be called upon to give at the last great day. You shall also pray for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments, for bishops, and herein more especially for Felix, the bishop of this diocese, for Scott and Celestine, our bishops suffragan, and for Henry, our archbishop and primate, that they may minister faithfully and wisely the discipline of Christ, likewise for all priests and deacons, and, more, and herein more especially for the clergy here residing, for Isaac the rector, and for John our deacon, that they may shine as lights in the world, and in all things may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And you shall pray for a due supply of persons fitted to serve God in the ministry and in the state. And to that end, as well as for the good education of all the youth of this land, you shall pray for all schools, colleges, and seminaries of sound and godly learning, and for all whose hands are open for, that, for their maintenance, that whatsoever tends to the advancement of true religion and useful learning may forever flourish and abound. You shall pray for the people of these United States, that they may live in the true faith and fear of God, and in brotherly charity one towards another. You shall pray also for all who travel by land, sea, or air, for all prisoners and captives, for all who are in sickness or in sorrow, for all who have fallen into grievous sin, for all who, through temptation, ignorance, helplessness, grief, trouble, dread, or the near approach of death, especially need our prayers. You shall also praise God for rain and sunshine, for the fruits of the earth, for the products of all honest industry, and for all his good gifts, temporal and spiritual, to us and to all men. Finally, ye shall yield unto God most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all his saints who have been the choice vessels of his grace and the lights of the world in their several generations. And pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, that, this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection and the life everlasting. And now, brethren, summing up all our petitions and all our thanksgivings, in the words which Christ hath taught us, we make bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who saidst unto thine apostles, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of thy church, and grant to it that peace and unity which is according to thy will. Who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. 
Assist us mercifully, O Lord, in these our supplications and prayers, and dispose the way of thy servants toward the attainment of everlasting salvation, that, among all the changes and chances of this mortal life, they may ever be defended by thy most gracious and ready help, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.